Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Welcome to the Great Women in Compliance Podcast with Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine. My name is Mary Shirley, and today we welcome back Mel Stanley, who is doing a two-part series on personal branding. So um, we are just going to continue off with where we started uh, last time and uh, get straight to business here. So, um, Mel, uh, one of the questions that I have for you, um, which I think is something that uh, a lot of um, compliance officers um, will uh, find resonates, is that um, in our field, we strive to be seen as human and not rigid sticklers for rules without consideration of full facts and thinking through alternative avenues to meet the the goal of, of our business stakeholders. But but particularly in the past, it was common for compliance officers to be referred to as the fun police or the dream crushers. We were kind of the the policemen who always said no. Um, And and of course, that's um, a a culture change in compliance. What can we do in order to help facilitate our human side as part of our um, reputation building with our internal clients? Yeah, and... and, um uh, in, so in my background, um, I've, I've worked with compliance uh, professionals in, 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 in different mm-hmm. um, organisations based on financial services, which is heavily regulated in, in the UK, um, but particularly on the energy side. So I, and I, I understand that because I've, I've maybe not heard those exact terms, but um, certainly um, the, uh, the detail police and things like that have been uh, a descriptions of, of, of the brand, if you like, of, of compliance. So I think um, one of the things here is, is almost trying to move away from being seen as a blocker to an enabler, as mm. a, both of but also as individuals Mm -hmm. and and I think to move into this idea that compliance is necessary and valued as part of the mix rather than um, preventative Um, and you know I'm a big believer in um, never letting perfection get in the way of progress so sometimes I have um, in in various jobs um, clashed with um, compliance people because their role is to protect uh, the integrity and um, the regulation, the detail and everything that goes with that. And as an individual, um, of course, I'm interested in that and I know it's a good thing to do, mm-hmm. but I'm also, you know, having worked in advertising, I'm much more in the sort of, can we just get on and do it <laughs> yes. um, sort of um, uh, <laughs> idea. And, and I think there's, um, I think there's, there's something that comes into play here, which, um, and I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of, it's not amateur psychology, but something that mm-hmm. we do in, yep. our, in our workshops. Um, so, you know, different people get um, attracted to different types of job, depending on their skill set, but also um, what they find interesting. You know, we mm-hmm. all like to really go for what we're good at. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I don't know whether, I mean, you'll, you'll no doubt may be familiar with, with Myers-Briggs and, mm-hmm. um, yep. and color analysis that says you know what's um sort of what what are the kind of drivers and the motivators for you as an individual and when I've done some workshops where it have had like completely across the board different women in there and we've had you know compliance or regulatory individuals in there which is the case at EDF they often come out in um in, in the blue area so logical analytical um really deep into the detail and and love all of that. And that's what makes them um, really good at what they do. But it takes time for them to come to a decision because they want lots and lots of data and they don't like to be hurried. And this is where this sort of, um, you know, that taking a little time and holding things up and killing people's dreams and all the rest of it comes from. But that is what those people are really, really good at. And then you get in other teams, um, you know, the reds who just want stuff done quickly with no questions asked. You get the yellows who um, are very creative and have a big picture vision. Um, and then you've got the greens who are very people focused. And all of those people play a big part in the team. But 
um, they can all have and be impacted by the personalities of, of, of blues and this detail. Because what I, as a red, um, call dithering to a blue is getting the facts absolutely mm. right. Mm-hmm. And we all have to really become aware of what other people's strengths are. And, and this again goes back to, you know, your personal brand. And I think the thing, you know, how do you humanize it is, levity um just empathy for how others are perceiving what you're doing as well as how you are perceiving them and this you know listening and empathy is a, is a big part of all of all leadership and how teams collaborate and work together um but there must be you know different ways of presenting um compliance that can be um you know it, is is there a more fun aspect or a um or something that's just makes it a little less intense, adds a bit more levity. It could mm. be in the delivery of how your compliance team deliver really, really important information. Um, does it all have to be charts done and graphs and things like that? Can it be done, you know, in, in other ways? And, and I think that's the way to really move away from, um, perhaps being seen as the as the fun police but this blocker to enabler is is something we we worked in with um, in my last company edf which was a big energy company and, and nuclear based so very very heavily regulated um on how almost rebranding compliance from within um by getting the clients team to understand that they had an absolutely great job to do and they were really really good at it um and this is the perception and it's you know it's it's how if you were doing feedback on compliance what would you hear you know it's and and how therefore do you do you address it and it's only really if you think about personal brand teams and what that brand is like compliance an organization what that brand is it's all different levels of perception and reputation um, and working towards just if you don't want to be seen as um, as the fun police, then look at ways of of delivering the content. Um, you know, and be more inventive. Wonderful, and um, I've got something to add to that. Um, mm. I'm interested to see if you agree. Um, I, when I was very young, I read the book um, "Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office" by Lois P. Frankel, who is um, a psychologist, and one of her pieces of advice was. Um, maintain a professional outlook in your office, avoid having, you know, too many family photos and gimmicky things sitting around, unless you are in a a very serious role um, and you are like a person of authority, in which case um, try to include some of those personalized aspects. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, one of the things that I'm quite well known for is having a Hello Kitty phone case. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's often a, a good starting point for people. They think it's, it's, you know, novel and not what you'd expect from a, a compliance officer to walk in the room with. Is, is that something that you would support as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't hold... I mean, you know, we do see um, nice women get the corner office. We get we look at the mm-hmm. New Zealand president, Vendra um, mm. Arden, and um, <laughs> it's more than a corner office. But I, mm. I think I think being able to um, show little um, demonstrations of your personality yeah. and yeah. giving a little bit away um, of who you are mm. um, and your brand is is part of that. Um, I think one of the most unfortunate things actually about hot desking nowadays mm. is that people aren't encouraged to mm-hmm. um, stamp their personality on their workspace mm. uh, because somebody else might be sitting there the next day. And whether it's photographs or, as you say, a Hello Kitty um, work. But I used to have a I'm, – I'm a horse lover, and mm. I used to have the Black Beauty ring theme ringtone on my phone, <laughs> yeah. um, um, which, you know, it always used to go off in the office, and people used mm. to sing it. Mm. Um, and, you know, and it, it's a way of becoming um, a person as opposed mm-hmm. to a job. Mm. And, you know, personal brand is all as much about who you are as what you do. You know, nobody should ever be completely defined by what they do. Mm. Um, you have to add a little bit of, of personality onto it. Um, mm. So I would agree with doing that. But as I say, unfortunately, as we all work, m- m- move more towards work from home mm. and and hot desking, it's, I think it's going to be more difficult. And I think generally, yeah. from a branding perspective, it's much more difficult to 
um, convey who you are, uh, you know, over a Zoom call as mm. it is when you're face to face with people. Um, yeah. So those challenges are all going to be coming up thick and fast. Yeah, you might have to do a seminar on how to um, show your true self from the shoulders up. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And, and you know what? There's already loads of um, articles about how to appear at your best on a Zoom call. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, no, seriously. And things like yeah. you know, how to angle your computer, how to yeah. dress your background, because yes. the backgrounds that you can use are, yes. uh, aren't necessarily great. But it was all of that. And it's all mm. about presentation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of move away from personal brand being about what you wear. Um, I think it is, though, a lot about, um, you know, how you speak to people, the tone you use, the, the tone you use in written work like emails um, mm. and um, and less about, you know, what your, what your clothes are, but your, you know, your tone of voice, mm. and how you treat others. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and, and that's difficult when you're not in the workplace. Mm. Um, when you're just on these calls and you're not interacting with people where you can't see body language you know you literally can't see the white of somebody's eyes and how they're Mm. responding to something that you're saying Mm. absolutely well um i'm something that i uh have important to me and i'm guessing it's um uh, relevant to many of our listeners as well is that I'd really like part of my branding, especially in the workplace or on LinkedIn, to include my competence as a compliance professional and subject matter expert. So how do you recommend I cultivate my branding in this respect without coming across as arrogant or a show-off? How do you um, demonstrate your abilities without looking um, like one of those obnoxious uh, self-promoting people? <laughs> so, well, I mean, I think the first thing is if your your competency is a big part of, of your brand um, and that should be valued. And I think the, the, the big difference here is um, don't think of it as showing off your knowledge. Think of it as sharing your knowledge. And how you deliver and disseminate that knowledge can mm-hmm. play a big part in whether you are perceived as being arrogant and show off or not. Um, because let's be honest, you know, if, if competence is, is a great part of anybody's brand because nobody wants incompetence. Um, it's, <laughs> so it's, it's just <laughs> how, you, it's how you get it out there. So, mm-hmm. I think you can demonstrate it again. We've just talked about tone of voice with, without always speaking as the expert. So, you know, um, you, sometimes when we start talking about something that we know a lot about and um, mm. we're all guilty of this mm-hmm. and you come over very knowing and very sage, mm. and very, very serious. Mm. And, um, but, you know, if you, if you think of it as um, this, I call it brand width. So if you think of an old fashioned bell curve mm-hmm. and if you are at the top of that bell curve, mm-hmm. then that might be, you know, when you're at an interview, for example, and you want to appear at your very, very best and absolutely on it and at the mm-hmm. height of your brand. And then mm-hmm. lower down that, you know, you might be having um, drinks out after work and right at the bottom, it might be family time where mm-hmm. you're still who you are, but mm-hmm. you're not necessarily carrying those, you know, tropes of professionalism Mm. so if you think about how we deliver our content as subject matter experts um maybe you don't deliver it as the expert um and it comes back to what we were just talking about with um different ways of humanizing compliance how do you how can you go out there if you're um and and not seem to be i know everything about what i'm talking about Mm. i do but i'm sharing it I'm not delivering it. And you, you can also do that through your style of writing. Mm-hmm. So if you're writing blogs, for example, or articles, you, know, you can put in, bring in humor, um, little factoids that are interesting, um, you know, infographics, all of that kind of thing, can just still deliver the same content, but in, if you like, a less um, tell um, kind of way um, and you know, blogs so blogs are a great way to deliver subject matter expert content because they are by their very nature personal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And so you can absolutely write from your first person personality, from your personal brand personality, um, if you're writing a blog, because your readers are generally people who have bought into your style of writing. So there's, and that's, you know, that's how you can use LinkedIn in different ways. Um, so you've got a sort of Forbes style article, which might be for one type of subject matter. You've got a blog that might be for more personal insights, but still on um, expert subject matter. You might have mini posts that are just factoids of things that you've picked up. Um, that are with a interesting infographic or humorous inf infographic. So there's lots of ways of getting your expertise out there without having to grandstand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not be sounding that, like a professor. Yes, exactly that. And, um, you know, grandstanding is where I think we do get into the sort of you know, slightly show off arrogance. But you know what? Sometimes... In some situations, that is required. If you're speaking mm -hmm. at a thousand-person conference, mm -hmm. you know, then you really do need to be, you know, slightly <laughs> better like depending on who your audience is. Mm -hmm. And that's why this brand width thing works quite well because, you know, your your authenticity is still there, but your levels of, you know, showing your your true self vary depending mm -hmm. on what you're delivering and who you're speaking to. Perfect. And on that topic of how we come across, how, should, how will I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of me? That is, how can I figure out what my personal branding is right now as seen by others to help with the process of developing my branding in the direction that I want? So I think one of the best ways to do this is, um, is feedback. Um, we, where I think generally people are, there's two things. Uh, managers don't often give um, ongoing feedback it tends to be you know yearly down to an annual review or something like that and as individuals for one reason or another we don't ask for feedback um, I think women tend not to ask for feedback because it might come over as seeming that they want to be complimented on something uh, or mm -hmm. the other what's the flip side of that is they need reassurance um, um, you know mm -hmm. rather than it being seen as a genuine request mm. for honest as you say developmental um, feedback um, and there's lots of leadership um, courses that do um, have elements around how best to ask for feedback and also how to deliver feedback but I think that's the best way um, and maybe to do it outside of a formal situation um, because if, if it, in that there's sometimes there's structures that means that you you know you have to ask five people for example and they tell you who to ask because I think with feedback um, around branding you need not just to ask the people who you you work for or their peers or even just your peers but also the people who work for you um, even down to you know the graduate the most junior because as I say how how people take your brand um, will depend on how you speak to them how you behave with them you mm. know what, what impression you're creating so 360 feedback should be from everybody that as, or as many people as possible who are within your immediate network um, and um, and just try and get it as natural as possible I, I mean you know what am I? What, what what do I do now? That's good. What would you like me to change? Um, where am, where do you think I need to make serious improvements? You know, it's three questions, mm. dead easy, and mm. uh, it takes no time for somebody to just come back on that. Or even mm. if you're, um, you know, if you're doing something by way of a presentation or something, you simply, well, how did that go? Do you think mm. could I have made that better? Or you know, or did I come over as being a bit compliancey? Um, <laughs> You know, those, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and that's, that's how you'll get um, a real idea of what people are thinking. But you kind of have to do it on the hoof. Otherwise, as I say, there's always this fear that you've got an ulterior motive. But if mm -hmm. it just becomes, um, well, you know, I, I just need to know because I, I want to understand how I'm being perceived, what my reputation is, what people say about me when I leave the room. Um, mm. Because there are areas that I need to work on, then, you know, that's the benefit of me, but also everybody else around me. Mm. Absolutely. So, Mel, after I was inspired by a talk of yours recently, I was motivated to seek feedback, as you've just suggested, and I would highly recommend this exercise because while the core aim of it was to help with my personal branding, 
um, an unintended benefit um, of it was that I was blessed with the gift of hearing lovely compliments about myself, which now that you mentioned it, I hope people don't think that I was soliciting. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I, I recommend that you give it a go, dear listener. Um, and how I phrased it was, uh, I simply asked, uh, I just attended a personal branding workshop. May I ask what comes to mind when you think of me in terms of my brand? And then I wrote down the responses and took a look at them. Um, I noted that there were only a few repeats, even taking into account linguistic differences. And I know you mentioned consistency previously mm. being a bit of a problem area. So I want to ask you, Mel, is it a bad thing if brand is perceived differently and interpreted differently by, by um, various people around you, um, even though you might know them in the same relationship capacity, for example, professionally? Yeah. So... I think this comes back to the um, individual's impressions that are created, different types of mm -hmm. people. Um, so somebody who's going to respond to one thing that you, you, you generate within them positively, another person may see that same um, trait and, and see that as a weakness. Mm -hmm. So it comes back to the, um, you know, um, somebody who is interested in, quick decision-making and shooting from the hip um, mm. may be, as a compliance individual, um, your desire to get all the facts straight, uh, mm. slowing things up and dithering, for mm. example. Mm. Um, whereas somebody else who wants to have that level of evidence-based decision-making will see that as a real strength. Mm. So how people perceive different elements of our brand um, is, in some respects, beyond our control. What's important... I think, is to know what you want people to think mm -hmm. about you mm -hmm. um, and have a, um, in, in my workshops, we talk about, we try and boil our brand down to one word descriptor. Mm. So how this starts is if you were to leave the room, what's the one word or phrase that you would like people to attribute to you? Mm -hmm. because that's the platform to build your brand from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as long as you know because if that's something that you want to portray and that comes from obviously from your strengths and your values because it's about you then you know what um, that's the message you want to land so outside of that if you are being authentic and true to yourself and you know the mess the, the the descriptors that you want out there how people think about you then if they don't then that's fine mm -hmm. um, because you are resilient in knowing that, you know, you are who you are. And as I say, we, were, we are as individuals consumed differently by different people with different mm -hmm. agendas, different backgrounds and looking for different things. Um, so them being inconsistent is mm -hmm. one thing. You being inconsistent mm -hmm. is something entirely different. Right. You can't okay. control what other people say about you. You can only influence how you want to be perceived excellent all right that sounds good and for, for this next um part of the the episode um mel and i haven't prepared this in advance we're just <laughs> going to do an off the cuff um quick workshopping um so i'll share the feedback that i've received and we'll see if mel's got any um insights for me um using her expertise so i'll just run through these mel it'll take me a, a minute and then yep. we'll hear from you Okay, so I got smart, knowledgeable, articulate, honest, and easy, optimism, curiosity, connection, subject matter expert, speaker, advocate for compliance profession, mentor, hardworking, ever learning, great communicator and teacher, explains complex scenarios well, positive and upbeat, integrity, authenticity, commitment to promoting compliance, good communicator, consistent, high fashion world traveler. It's one of my favorites, I'm just going to say. Um, <laughs> compliance rock star, hard worker, team player, dependable, eloquent, prepared, unflappable, hardworking. What are your thoughts? Did you get any negatives? No, I didn't. Um, and you know what? What I did try was to, um, to, to, to approach colleagues as, as well as people I know better but some that I, I am not so, how to say, you know, very friendly with so that it would be a bit more objective. Yeah. So out of all of those, what would mm. be your preferred, if you had to boil it down to one or two things, what would be your preferred 
descriptor? Well, I think we'll put high fashion world traveler to the side for a minute. Um, <laughs> um, I think that's great. Um, and and for me, uh, especially in my personal capacity, I think that that does describe um, a lot about me. When it comes to the, the personal branding to do with work, um, I think, you know, when you said earlier, you know, think about one word that you'd really like people um, to, to, you know, if you boil it down, the word that came to mind for me was capable. So um, the ones that stick out that relate to that would be um, the comments like smart, knowledgeable, compliance um, advocate, um, compliance rock star, hardworking, um, eloquent, um, I got hardworking a few times, so that was one of my mm. overlap mm. ones, and I think that mm. does help with the capable side mm. somewhat. So those are the types of words that, to me, um, help to amplify the capable target or goal. Yeah. So, so when I look at that list, the one that I am immediately drawn to is compliance rock star. Mm. Mm. Immediately drawn to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I'm immediately drawn to that is actually based on the conversation that we've just been having mm. around how do we humanize um, compliance? How do mm-hmm. I uh, present my subject um, matter expertise without mm. coming over as arrogant and show offy? And mm. all of those other things, they're all great to have. Mm-hmm. You know, from a branding perspective, they're nowhere near as interesting as mm-hmm. compliance rock star. Mm. Uh, and if you were in one of my workshops, I would say that's got to be your descriptor. Because the thing yeah. about compliance rock star mm-hmm. is it encompasses everything. Mm. So if you are a rock star, then you've mm. got the competency, the capability, mm-hmm. the um, uh, the ease, the all of that. Mm-hmm. You've got all of that competency. But the rock star bit adds mm. an element of, creativity and interest Mm. to Mm -hmm. you as an individual Mm. Um, so you know compliance rocks mary shirley compliance rock star Mm. it you know it's it shows your passion for the subject but also that you are yourself delivering the detail around that subject and it gives you lots of space and room if you adopt that kind of persona to be able to write your content in certain ways, in mm. more rock star like styly than um, just very straight, you know, um, this, these are the, these are all things that you need to know about compliance. Mm. So it feels to me a much more um, inventive and innovative mm-hmm. um, brand descriptor mm-hmm. than capable, because of mm-hmm. course you're capable, you're in a senior job. And as I said earlier, you know, we, nobody wants people who are incapable or incompetent. <laughs> but, you know, capable, there's lots of capable people out there, a lot mm. of capable people out there. How many compliance rock stars are there? Mm. Wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a taste of Mel Stanley right there for you <laughs> and um, how she operates on an impromptu evaluation. That was super cool. Thanks, Mel, for, for indulging me and Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully our audience too, because um, as you can imagine with the audience that we have, Compliance Rockstar is something that I know many of um, our listeners uh, are and for those starting out um, aspire to be. So it's very relevant. Thank you. Yeah, no, I just kind of just had one thing on there because I'm just thinking. Yeah, what, yeah. Because the way you do, if, if you think about the feedback and, mm. you know, where all this comes from in my head, say classical brand marketing, mm. you mm. essentially did a research group on you. Mm. Yeah. And that research group came back with that insight, compliance rock star. So, yes, I just chose it because it's, you know, I think it is the most inventive. But mm. it just goes to show that if you ask the people out there, you know, you can get those those sound bites, those nuggets that you can really build something out of, mm. um, and um, that are still absolutely about you because you know it's what people said. It's it's mm. still authentic, but it just adds that pixie dust onto competency and capability. Absolutely, and you know I, I would say to anyone who's suffering a little bit from the issue that we talked about earlier, people who are. Um, dedicating some of their personal time to to build their profile in compliance. 
what I saw from this list is that probably my work on the podcast, my work um, speaking at conferences and, and soon to be publishing a book, um, I I don't believe my um, reputation for for being a compliance person would be as as strong or um, as extensive in terms of the words that first came to mind for people if I did not do those extracurricular activities. So for anyone out there who is feeling a little bit um, saddened by um, the uh, the reception of of their extracurricular hobbies and compliance by their colleagues. I think this is a really um, a, a great, it's a demonstrable show of how um, if you do commit to that extra work and that extra time and you, you do your research, um, it's really going to impact your personal brand. Absolutely agree. It, absolutely agree. And it is unfortunate as you say that you know it gets knocked and it just shows proof, um, goes back to the last podcast and, um, you know, talking mm-hmm. about the brick ceiling and the glass ceiling that um, mm-hmm. women have to try a lot harder. Yeah. Um, and it's not always going to be appreciated um, mm-hmm. because there are still, unfortunately, people who still think that, um, you know, there is a certain role in life for women and being in that corner office isn't it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, there's, you know, there are always going to be dissenters, but, you know, root out your advocates, root out your promoters, root out your sponsors mm-hmm. and, you know, find out what they want from you. Mm-hmm. And that's where you target your personal brand activity. Super. All right. Well, to, to wrap up today's um, episode, I have one more question for you, Mel. Yeah. What do you observe as being the most common way in which people sabotage their branding to their detriment? Um, well, we we see it a lot, don't we, with um, with very well known, high profile individuals. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think, <laughs> and um, but you know, actually, I mean, not just politicians, but um, mm. if you if uh, there's two I talk about here um, in terms of high profile because everybody knows them and can relate to them. But mm. you know, Richard Branson's personal brand versus Elon Musk's. Mm. Now, Elon Musk did a massive sabotage on his brand by just sending that one tweet. Um, right. the um the guys the divers that went in to help the mm. Thai kids that were um, yeah. stuck in the cave mm-hmm. and it was for whatever reason he did that goodness knows why but it absolutely killed his credibility dead mm. um and it was just the wrong thing to do i mean no, no matter what he, his personal view on it you mm. don't broadcast everything that you think um, mm. because that was him not managing um, his his brand and what was going mm. to be seen so mm-hmm. um, I think there's obviously doing something that's completely unexpected and ex- unacceptable is one thing trying to be something that you're not is another and un- and I think um, not just women but m- Many women are uh, fall foul of this, so they try and adopt, for example, um, male traits because they think that's what mm. they need to do to get ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and in doing so, they become inauthentic, and you know they they lose the respect mm. of people doing that. Um, so, I think. There's a there's a concept which for me is is success without compromise, which means you you, you become successful simply by doing, um, being who you are, mm-hmm. and so inauthentic behaviour, saying one thing, doing something else, um, again that can sabotage your brand. Flakiness, you know, in in the workplace, indecision, reversing um, decisions, um, you know that can become what you are known for. And if you want to be a compliance rock star, then the last thing anybody else wants to be is known as being the one that's indecisive. I can't Mm. believe what that person says because they always change their mind. Mm. So those are the kind of things that sabotage your personal brand. But it comes down to, you know, manage it, be consistent, be authentic, make sure it always comes from the right place and then you can't go wrong. And that's what gives you resilience in the face of the detractors. Mm. And for anyone who's still thinking that you need to be acting like a man um, to thrive, I would give the example that you mentioned earlier of Jacinda Ardern, who is my country's um, prime minister. Um, What I think has been really interesting about Jacinda's leadership over the last few years 
is that she has um, led with traditionally female traits. So, um, for example, leading with empathy, talking about victims of terrorist attacks rather than giving all the publicity um, to the attacker. Uh, that type of thing um, has has proven, at least in the New Zealand context, and, and one would assume that it, it, it is transferable to other um, regions as well, that that has been an incredibly successful way to lead and get buy-in from constituents. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And there's a... Um if anybody wants to dig out a an article that was it's been widely published, but I think again it was um, Harvard Business Review that published it first about level five leadership, mm. um, and level five leadership is all about empathy and listening and compassion and working with people um, and not necessarily always wanting to uh, spearhead and take the credit, mm. whereas the, the traditional cookie cutter approach for leaders is more level four mm. which is, you know the ones the leaders that you will know about mm-hmm. uh, the Steve Jobses of the world um mm. whereas there's lots of actually male level five leaders who you'll never have heard of for that mm. reason but mm. they still run very very profitable companies um so absolutely um I think this idea of uh, but I see it very often and we did I did used to see it in advertising a lot women mm. who used to just think that they almost they had to wear the trousers they had to ritually humiliate people um and and it's you know it, it was kind of the devil wears prada-esque mm. and it doesn't work it certainly doesn't work in this society nowadays yeah agree well mel uh, i can't thank you enough for what at least for me um and I, i'm pretty sure that means our leaders as well um, our listeners as well has been um, an incredibly fascinating um, uh, series from you. Uh, I, I know that compliance isn't your um, main uh, area in which you operate in, but um, you've you've done really nicely to to draw um, areas of distinction and relevance for us. And um, you're clearly um, a very strong expert at what you do. Capable, if I can say so. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, rock star. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, you're fantastic. And um, uh, invite um, our listeners to, to follow you on social media and, and get some more tips and, and see the types of things that you share because I find them incredibly valuable um, to, to go towards the advancement and empowerment of, of women professionals. So thank you so much for your time and your expertise. You are fantastic. Thank you very much, Mary. It's been um, lovely talking to you. Wonderful. And to you, dear listener, if you enjoyed this series or our other episodes, I invite you to take a look at um, the review and rating section of uh, whatever podcast player you're using to listen uh, into our our podcast. Um, If you're enjoying it, um, please uh, feel free to to, to give us your feedback. If you're not enjoying it, I imagine you wouldn't have gotten to the end of this episode and can't hear me anyway, um, but always feel free to contact Lisa or myself. We love to hear from you. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review.